We are so blessed, Jesus. And we praise your name this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, worship team. You may have a seat, Bazalwai. First of all, I would like to greet Mfundisi, Mama Mfundisi, the elders and their wives, the deacons and their wives, Tibulisa Otata, Tibulisa Omama, Tibulisa all the young people in the house of the Lord this morning. I greet you all saints in the wonderful name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. For those of you who do not know me, Ikamalam Ndingu Asitandile, Ifan Ndingu Nozeu, and I'm a young person who is born again, who loves the Lord, and it's such a great honor this morning to be standing before you to share the word of God. I believe that Utiko Utetile Nam, and the word that he is going to speak through me was not just for me, but it's all for all of us. Saints, without the waste of any time, I would like us to find a scripture reading from Seto for this morning in the book of Genesis, chapter 6, verse 1. God is so great. In the first service, and I actually spoke to him during the break, and I was like, it's weird how God spoke to you and reminded you about the covenant that he made with Noah. Because this morning he has given me a message based on the times of Noah. So utiko ungutiko, a confirmation indeed. I would like to believe that there is something that he wants to emphasize to us as a church. We will find our scripture reading from the book of Genesis chapter 6. Verse 1 to 9, in the message ver version, it says, When the human race began to increase, with more and more daughters being born, the sons of God noticed that the daughters of men were beautiful. They looked them over and picked out wives for themselves. Then God said, I'm not going to breathe life into men and women endlessly. Eventually, they're going to die. From now on, they can expect a lifespan of 120 years. This was back in the days and also later when there were giants in the land. These giants came from the union of the sons of God and the daughters of men. These were the mighty men of ancient law, the famous ones. God saw that human evil was out of control. People thought evil, imagined evil, 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 evil from morning to night. God was sorry that he had made the human race in the first place. It broke his heart. God said, I'll get rid of my ruined creation. Make a clean sweep. People, animals, snakes and bugs, birds, the works. I'm sorry that I made them. Verse 8. But Noah was different. God liked what he saw in Noah. This is the story of Noah. Noah was a good man, a man of integrity in his community. God bless the reading of his word in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when I was a child growing up in church, I grew up in the children's ministry, which is what we used to call it back then. One of the stories that we definitely learned about was the story of Noah. And every time I heard this story, it would always be angled in a way that the focus would be on how God told Noah to build an ark and how he saved Noah and his family from the floods. I mean, we sang songs about Noah, 
And I know that you know that there's a song right now that's trending, even won an award as the best song, I think, in the Metro FM Awards. And it's about Noah. I mean, and it's also about Noah and the ark and the floods. But God has been talking to me lately about Noah. But not necessarily in the sense of how he built the ark and how he and his family got saved from the floods. Lately, God has been making emphasis in my heart about studying about the times of Noah. The story of Noah is found in the first book of the Bible, which is the book of Genesis. And it comes in the sixth chapter. In chapter one of the book of Genesis, we see how God created the universe, how he created the animals and everything on earth. Chapter two kind of concludes on God's creation. And then it zooms in on the creation of men and the environment in which man lived. We're also introduced to the woman, Eve. And we are told that she was meant to be the helper to the man. Chapter two is the last glimpse of the world before it is corrupted through the disobedience um, of Eve, Eve and Adam. In chapter three, we see Adam and Eve disobeying God, and we see the entrance of sin into the world. Chapter four depicts the tragic story of the two brothers that were born by Adam and Eve, which were Cain nor Abel. Chapter five is the genealogy of Adam, the account of his descendants. And right at the end of this chapter, we are introduced to a man named Noah. The Bible says that his father named him Noah and said that he would give them rest and comfort. And then we get to chapter 6, where we are this morning. Here we get the context of Noah's life on earth. The writer of this chapter starts off by telling us about the state of the earth during the times of Noah. We are told about the wickedness of humanity and how sin was rampant to the extent that God regretted that he had made humankind. Verse 5 to 7 say, God saw that human evil was out of control. People thought evil, imagined evil, 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 evil from morning to night. God was sorry that he had made the human race in the first place. So we can imagine how dark of a time it must have been during the time of Noah. That humanity must have been so out of control that there must have been no kind of evil that was not present at the time. The times were so evil that the opening lines of this chapter say, when the human race began to increase, with more and more daughters being born, the sons of God noticed that the daughters of men were beautiful. They looked over and picked out wives for themselves. Now this talks about the sons of God, not the sons of men. The sons of God marrying the daughters of men. In other Bible translations, it actually says, it actually refers to these sons of God as divine beings. And as a result, some scholars argue that these were probably angels that were living in rebellion against God. And the Bible says that there were giants in the land. And these giants came as a result of the union between the sons of God and the daughters of men. Now the earth was filled with these giants. These creatures that were weird looking, that were not necessarily human, but were not necessarily angels either. The, the Bible just refers to them as 
giants. And these giants were filling up the earth. Now this gives us an understanding as to why God decided to wipe out everything that was living on earth. Because if you remember in the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 to 29, God tells Adam and Eve to be fruitful, to multiply, and to fill the earth. But now because of the presence of sin, God's instruction and vision was perverted by humanity through the devil. The devil knew that God had said in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 that the seed of the woman would fatally bruise his head. And so his tactic was so that he can introduce these creatures to fill up the earth so that the vision of God and the instruction of God may not happen and that the woman would not eventually give birth to the Messiah. And so these were the kind of things that were happening in the earth during Noah's time. Everything was evil. There was evil everywhere. Violence everywhere. Sexual immorality everywhere. And as a result, in this chapter, we see the intense disappointment of God. When humanity fails to live up to the intention that he had for their lives, he says, I am sorry I made them. But then we get to verse 8. And on verse 8, we see a shift. The Bible says, but Noah was different. God liked what he saw in Noah. I think we tend to romanticize this verse quite a lot in the sense that we like to glorify and highlight the glory that comes with being different. And we hardly ever talk about the pain that comes with being different. The cost that comes with being different. The loneliness that comes with being different. We kind of crown Noah as the hero of his time, but I'm sure that Noah never felt like a hero at that time. I'm sure he felt very lonely. I'm sure he felt very misunderstood. I'm sure he felt like he was out of place, like something was wrong with him. Because it's never an easy choice to choose to swim against the tide. What's easy is to go in the direction of where the water is flowing. That's easy. But on this verse, verse 8, Noah is being introduced to us, firstly, as an individual. Secondly, not just any individual, but an individual who was an exception in that particular time. Here we are told, we are not told about Noah and his friends. We are only told about Noah. In other words, there was only one of his kind in a world full of people. And at that time, the world was getting pretty populated because children were born. And if you can remember, the lifespan of humanity was quite long. People lived up to 800 years, 900 years. So there were lots of people in the earth. Yet there was Noah. He didn't even make up 1% of the population. I can't imagine the kind of conviction that one would need to have to choose to honor God with their life, even if uwedwa imthabeni. That was Noah. In the King James Version, it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I can imagine that it must have taken something that was more than Noah to stand for the Lord 
in a time that was very evil. It must have taken a force that was stronger than his flesh and his own will to stand and honor God with his life, yet nothing around him inspired him to. It must have taken something within him that caused him to stand and be an exception in his time. And I'd like to put it to you this morning, saints, that what kept Noah different in his time was that he found grace. And that's why this morning I have titled this sermon as Grace to be Different. What Noah's story is telling me is that there is grace to be different. The King James Version does not say that grace found Noah, but that Noah found grace. And the argument that I would like to put forward to you this morning is more from the perspective that when you want to be different, you will realize that there is grace that comes with seeking to be different. Grace that enables you to stand out from the rest. That while others are drowning in the culture of the time, Noah was flowing with God. Noah did not just experience grace in the sense of grace being mercy and forgiveness. But he also tapped into the reality that grace is power. Power that allows an individual to flow with God. Even when circumstances do not allow them to. In a time that was dark, Noah found grace to be pure. In a time when humanity was corrupt, Noah found grace to be a man of integrity. In a time when humanity was said to be evil, Noah found grace to be a good man. Noah wasn't just doing it out of his own strength and his own ability and his own power. Otherwise, I think that he would have also drowned with the rest of the people. But rather, Noah found grace that enabled him and empowered him and strengthened him to be different. Noah's story is biblical evidence for us today, to see that it is possible to live for God in a world where evil is trending, that it's possible to be in the world but not be of the world. The times in which Noah lived, the Bible says that people thought evil, imagined evil, 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 evil from morning to night. Yet in the same breath it says, Noah was different. That God liked what he saw in Noah, even when he did not like what he saw in humanity. Now if there's ever a man that I think I should learn from in the Bible, it's definitely Noah. Because Jesus says in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 37, in the Amplified, he says, For the coming of the Son of Man, the Messiah, will be just like the days of Noah. What does that mean to me? It means that I need to study how Noah was able to please God in a generation that had no interest in obeying or pleasing God, pretty much what, like what's happening today. Studying about Noah made me think, if God would decide to wipe, up, wipe, wipe out humanity today, would he single me out? Would he say, but Asitandile was different? I therefore took lessons and points from Noah because I realized that I need to tap into the grace that Noah, Noah found to be different. And I learned a few things 
from Noah. Firstly, I learned that in order for Noah to tap into the grace to be different, he had to give God his yes. In other words, Noah had to agree to partner up with God. Because that's how grace flows into your life. What I've learned in my personal journey of faith with the Lord is that grace does not flow where there is no yes. In areas of my life where I have seen that there was no grace, it was mostly because I had not given God my yes. We tend to think of grace as an abstract concept. However, grace, is the manifestation of God's love and God's goodness for humanity. And for as long as there are areas in our lives where we are not giving God yes, we will continue to not see his goodness and his love for us in those areas. What I've learned is that if you want to live a life that is different from the culture of the world, you have got to know how to partner up with grace. You have got to know how to consciously walk with grace. Maybe you're asking, what does it look like to consciously walk with grace? It means that it is to have a mindset that is focused on the goodness and the love of God for you. That even in moments of weakness, you are able to stop and remember that God's goodness and love are able to save you from your fleshly weaknesses. Saints, this life of grace is all about completely depending on a God whose love is deep. A God whose love is wide. A God whose love is unfailing. And his love allows us to tap into his grace. Walking consciously with your mind conscious to the fact that God loves you. God wants to be good to you. Secondly, what I learned from the life of Noah was that Noah was a man of strong conviction. One person once explained to me what the difference between conviction and opinion is. They said, an opinion is something that you hold, but a conviction is something that holds you. Noah was convicted about who God said he was. He did not follow the trends of the time because he believed all that God had said about him. He believed that his life and the call of God upon his life was different. He fully understood that the assignment attached to his life and the purpose of God attached to his life was different. His father had named him Noah and said he would bring rest and comfort. Therefore, he knew that his life was different, that he was to bring something different in the world. And that's why he had a very strong conviction. Lastly, Noah was not a people pleaser. Had Noah been a people pleaser, I don't think we would be reading about him today. If he had been the kind of person who tries to keep up with the culture, he would have never, he would have had the same destiny as the rest of the people. But instead, Noah had the courage to resist the temptation of being caught up in the whirlwind of a drowning society. Noah did not care what people had to say about him. He didn't care about the names they called him. He didn't care about the labels they put on him. The problem with us today is that we idolize human opinion. Especially in this era of social media, 
We have become a society that is addicted to people's approval. Proverbs chapter 29 verse 25 says in the message version, the fear of human opinion disables. But trusting in God protects from that. The fear of human opinion disables because when we live our lives focused on getting the approval of people, we miss hearing what God has to say about our lives. I discovered a verse, Matthew, I think it's John, sorry. John chapter 5, verse 41, where Jesus himself tells people where to get off. Just saying. He says, in the NLT, he says, your approval means nothing to me. Hello. (laughs) If Jesus could say that, I can say that too. Your approval means nothing to me. That's powerful. Jesus was showing us that if we ever want to live lives that honor God in a world where evil is infiltrated, we have to be able to tell people, your approval of me means nothing. And as I conclude, (laughs) as I conclude, I would like to say, if fitting in is more important to you than standing out, then you will never tap into the grace of God that allows an individual to be different. And you will never do great things for God in your generation. You will have the same destiny as everyone else in the world. In fact, you should stop telling people that you are a Christian. Because there is no one that God has saved so that they could fit into the culture of the world. Finding grace to be different is to tap into your God-given uniqueness. Understanding that there has never been anyone like you and there will never be anyone like you. God did not invest so much in you so that you could melt into a drowning society. Here you are trying to fit in with the culture, but the culture never made you. The culture never saved you. The culture does not know your God-given purpose, but you're trying to fit in with it. If it would be wise enough to learn from the times of Noah, we would know that the culture has nothing to offer us except for destruction. When we spend more time with the one who created us, we find that there is grace to be different. We would know that God did not save us and expect us to live a holy and pure and righteous life just it. But that he also supplied the necessary grace to flow with him. If you have the mindset, you're about, ah, no, it's not possible to live a holy life. We're all human. Yeah, we have weaknesses. If you are a Christian who insists on having the mentality that the true version of you is your flesh, then I say this respectfully, but this message is not for you. This message is for the person who wants to tap into the grace of God that that allows you to live a life that is different from the world. And if that's you... I pray that God gives you the courage. I pray that God gives you the confidence. 
I pray that God gives you the boldness, the fearlessness. I pray that God makes you unapologetic in this critical time on earth. I pray that God gives you a revelation of who you are and empower you to live out a, the life that he has called you to live. That you may impact lives for the advancement of the kingdom of God on earth. I pray that people may be drawn to you and be inspired by the message of your life. In Jesus' name, amen.